Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Bajo's Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well this Sunday morning. Uh, today, through the course of this particular session, we will be starting a quick new series, and uh, this series is occasionally going to be conducted as well. Ek Nazar Subcover. This is the first part of Ek Nazar Subcover, and there will be two important things that we'll be covering via this particular session. So please get your notepads, get your notebooks, get your A4 size sheets, uh, whatever uh, paraphernalia you want to get in terms of stationery, please keep it organized on your table because there'll be a lot of writing uh, for all of you. Uh, so without further ado, I think let's just quickly kick, kick start the study. So good morning, Tehmina, Nikomoni. Uh, there is Ankush, there's Sunil, Shikha, Pragya, Rupesh, Vahida, Ami, Shikha, Seema, Prashant, Pragya, Anna. It was Anna's birthday two days ago. Um, Suraj, uh, good morning, everybody. I really appreciate all of you uh, being on time, sharp uh, uh, on time. And I, I think with Anna's birthday, I've been marketing it right really well. Some students are aware about it. Okay, so without further ado, let's just quickly get started. Uh, we will be posting regular questions on the Telegram platform, so please feel free to stay connected on Nature English UGC Net. Uh, we're also trying to experiment a little with uh, certain live sessions for our Telegram subscribers at 11:30 p.m. Uh, yes. Today was the inaugural edition for revision. Uh, we'll just test waters and see how things proceed. But I think if the intention is good to revise and if all of you will be able to benefit, we'll of course continue with the 11.30 a.m. live sessions as well regularly. Uh, because for your examination perspective, revision obviously becomes really important and uh, really important. So please just make it, make a note of it. Uh, and, and like I said, I'll be posting certain questions regularly with audios uh, for all of you to actually uh, quickly review certain questions. Okay. All right. Uh, great. So without further ado, let's just very, very quickly get started. Like I said, this is the uh, this is one of the new series that we'll have Ek Nazar Subcover. And in Ek Nazar Subcover Part 1, we will be focusing on two important things. OK, by the end of this particular class, you will be able to revise. How can you actually review your baronage literature, review your early Tudor literature? You will also understand how are you supposed to be revising Britlet? What is supposed to be the strategy that needs to be followed to revise Britlet, to revise world literature? What all things do you have to focus on? How much depth do you have to get into? Uh, those questions will be sorted. And simultaneously, we'll be discussing a really uh, interesting uh, topic, which also comes in your exams, by the way, that is the rise of novel. So there, there will be two uh, slightly different divergent topics that we'll be covering in Ek Nasar Subcover Part 1 today. Uh, and both these topics are really important. We'll be using certain pie charts, flow charts in a very interesting manner. We'll try to cover this up. We will be looking at all these details as well. Uh, so just get your notepads. Uh, both these topics are really important. You see questions coming from them every now and then. Uh, for instance, questions coming on Thomas Eliot, questions coming on the rise of novels. So both the topics are equally important. Uh, it's not that you know one is more important or uh, the other so and, and you'll also get more clarity as to how you're supposed to be proceeding when it comes to your uh, overall approach that needs to be followed overall strategy that needs to be followed uh, when you're talking about looking at British writings okay uh, so these are the two things that we'll be covering through the course of this particular video session uh, like I said if you are wondering uh, if you are in a double whammy situation you're not really sure how you can actually uh, go ahead and proceed with your studies so please feel free to connect with with us uh, for the score booster batch. Uh, the score booster batch is live right now. So all of you can actually uh, review, revise, get that proper uh, preparation support uh, when it comes to your score booster batch. So you can check more details online about the score booster batch. It will definitely help you out uh, with your entire preparation. And now the sessions are actually going to be, be get, becoming better as well. Okay. All right, so uh, let's just very, very quickly get started. Now, the first most important pointer that all of you have to keep in mind is that whenever you are approaching, and this is something which is directly taken. So if you look at uh, today's deck that you'll be able to see, uh, you will find a lot of stuff in Orient Black Swan. So Orient Black Swan, Paul Poplowski, uh, uh, directly picked up, and of course, Promote K. Nair, P.K. Nair. Uh, so, so those are the, the three reference materials that, that have been used to compile 
this stuff together now please remember that the background is equally important you are all students who are cultural studies scholars you are all students who are new historicism scholars and we all know the importance of background texts are not emerging in a vacuum remember that none of the texts that we read none of the texts that we are actually looking at they do not uh, uh, they do not come in a vacuum texts are having a particular context that we all have to be very mindfully aware about so in that particular scenario when we know that there is a context that we have of the text so it is important for us to unpack that so the first most tn singh also uh, there's this uh, book that you're having by dr tn singh that also gives you a brilliant account rather i see a lot of online blogs actually copy pasting whatever has been written in tn singh as well so uh, a lot of these books like you know which try tell you like paul poplowski tn singh they tell you about the importance of background knowing unpacking the ideas that is also equally critical from uh, our examination perspective so the first important thing is the 100 years war the 100 years war is actually the immediate backdrop of the baron age the early tudor period and remember the early tudor period is also coming because post modern literature of writers like hilary mantel is using the early tudor history hilary mantel writing wolf hall bring up the bodies the booker award winning writer getting the booker prize twice is also using the early tudor period why is the early tudor period so important the early tudor period is primarily important because we are able to see that church of england is getting established right the church of england is getting established protestantism is coming up renaissance humanism is there so there are certain pivotal changes that are taking place there's a transition that we are able to notice that is taking place in england right so that is another important aspect that you are able to look at okay so whenever we are looking at yes very good pragya absolutely right yes tahmina she has got the booker prize twice so whenever we are looking at any period knowing the background becomes non negotiable for english literature students imagine if you don't know the background you will not be able to understand anything of the restoration age you will not be able to understand dryden dryden is a very tropical writer you will have to know about the restoration period in order to uncover dryden or you will not come to know why henry fielding is writing in a particular way why is he so critical of the walpolian government he is criticizing walpole's government altogether or remember very recently when we were talking about your condition of england novels your social novels when we were looking at the political novels remember the political no novels anthony trollope palliaser novels day before yesterday or i think we were talking about palliaser novels for instance or the barsetshire novels that we were talking about so what you are able to see is that background becomes important to foreground the text and this is exactly what new criticism new historicism also says new historicism says the background the quote the, the context becomes the cortex the background has to be foregrounded that is really important that is another aspect that we are able to look at right and even rotlet actually yeah rotlet also actually does that suraj was mentioning this comment so please make sure um Zia is asking, is William J. Long enough? See, no one book will be enough, but definitely, even if you're reading William J. Long and you add on more, ah, uh, you will definitely be able to benefit out of it. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Yes, Pragya, the licensing act is coming out then. So, ah, uh, what is this period? This is a war that is being fought between France and England, and it's elongated altogether. And ah, uh, predominantly, we're able to see that because of this, literature is actually suffering because obviously, literature requires a very conducive environment. Literature requires Uh, an absolutely conducive environment where uh, there isn't a lot of anarchy there isn't a lot of destruction uh, so literature is going to be fermenting in that sort of a period compare this idea with edmund burke edmund burke was absolutely uh, so so when when you look at burke's notions uh, on reflections on revolution in uh, uh, in france for instance or you know when when you're looking at the other writers talking about revolution like thomas paine so there also you so augustan age prose writers for instance also please remember literary criticism like i've told you to study literary criticism it's always a good idea to study non fictional prose writings for co covering literary criticism it's always a good idea to actually cover non fictional prose writers as well okay so please keep that in mind all right please keep that aspect in mind always always remember that now king edward the 3 king edward the 3 is coming in and we are able to see that there are these battle of at crecy poitiers agincourt which are coming in but it's actually a politically wrought period uh, england and france are fighting that's the reason elizabethan age will be more tranquil a period 
Elizabethan age will be more stable in nature. The 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 Spanish the defeat of the Spanish Armada uh, 1588 is also going to be bearing testimony that naval on the naval front also Queen Elizabeth is trying to uh, just make sure that you know England is becoming geopolitically a very stable country. Now, what you, you are basically able to see over here is you are in a position to see that there are problems that are coming. And what is the problem? The problem is about ownership of the throne. The ownership of the throne. The French should come because remember, after the Norman conquest, the French are also thinking that it's their rightful possession. Uh, so it is about ownership of the throne, whether you want a French descendant or the English descendant, which family should the own, uh, like, you know, the, the seat should be occupied with. That is the major, like, you know, if you just put it in layman's term, that is something which is being discussed over here, right? English or the French, they are trying to figure out that how can they, how can they, I'll just uh, reduce my figure a little bit so that, uh, like, this this image which is coming in, so that all of you would be, so, so that is becoming a major concern. That is becoming, like, a predominantly major concern that we are able to see. That is becoming a major, major concern. That ownership has to be taken by which uh, by by which particular monarch, the English descendant or the French descendant altogether. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that when we are looking at, and this is really important, these are lines directly taken from T. N. Singh, um, and this is something that you find in a couple of blogs, etc. Also, now you have to keep in mind, you have to keep in mind that uh, how is the society divided? Remember yesterday during the live session at 11.30 p.m. on IG, on Instagram, uh, what were we talking about? We were discussing about the fact that uh, that John Gower is talking about. So, so you have the French period, you have the Latin period, you have the English period, two works coming in the English period. But what were we discussing? If you just go back to that live session, I've shared it on the Telegram platform also. We are talking about this entire aspect that, you know, uh, that, uh, that there is this need to document, like, for instance, uh, Gower is talking about the uh, Gower is talking. He is discussing about the Vat Tyler rebellion. Uh, we are able to see that that people are critically like you know uh, against the immortality of the period, just like Gower we spoke about yesterday. So people are really angry with the clergy. The clergy has got a lot of uh, wrath of people. People are not at all happy. There's a, there are gradations in the society. Also remember that it's primarily a sort of a feudal setup that you are having. Right. Uh, and, and that is what Renaissance is actually trying to change as well in certain parts of Europe. But when you talk about England, what is happening? You have the aristocracy. You're having the uh, the ecclesiastical order. You are having the, the, the ecclesiastical order. The clergy is there. Then you have the aristocratic order. These are courtiers who are coming in. A lot of writing will be uh, coming from the courtier community. Sydney is there. Sydney is therefore called the silver poet, the silver uh, folk poet. Why? Because he's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's very well connected with the nobility. So you also should be able to understand the fact that, you know, uh, what are the what is the hierarchy like? And that is the reason you get questions on uh, which characters are coming from where ecclesiastical order, women characters, which occupations are they coming from in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So what you're able to see is that aristocracy was, of course, there. Uh, however, you are having Froissart. Froissart is a French chronicler. Yesterday, we talked about Christine de Troyes. Remember, yesterday at 11.30 p.m. Uh, on the live session, we spoke about Christine de Troyes. And we said that he was the one of the first, the French poet, to talk about Arthurian romances. So, Froissart, the French chronicler, is coming. And he is talking about the English archer and says, They let fly their arrows so wholly together, so thick that it seems snow. That it seems snow. So, um, Froissart, Froissart is also a chronicler. He's trying to capture the times. He's trying to capture the essence altogether. Questions can come on, uh, on this as well. All these people who are chronicling and telling us the history, they are also equally important from the examination perspective. <clears throat> Just excuse me. So, sorry. Right. So, they are also equally important from the examination perspective that you can actually keep in mind. Right. Excellent, Nikomoni. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Okay. Uh, so, you can you can actually keep that in mind. Okay. So, we saying, are we saying, yeah, please do that. And based on your feedback, we can always give shape to the entire session. The Black Death, the Peasants' Revolt. Yesterday, also, we were talking about how Gower is also talking about the Peasants' Revolt. William Langland also talks about the Peasants' Revolt. It's only, it's only Geoffrey Chaucer 
Chaucer who's not mentioning about the peasants' revolt, right? It's only Geoffrey Chaucer who's not mentioning. Uh, but his only ecclesiastical order is the church-related order. Ecclesiastical order is the clergy, the church-related order that we are talking about. That's the ecclesiastical order that we are having, okay? Uh, so the Black Death is there, the peasants' revolt is there, the labor unrest is there. So this is a period where we are able to see everything is chaotically uh, placed. There's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of ruckus, there's a lot of... Um there, there is a lot of anarchy of sorts that we're able to see, be it religion, be it people not being satisfied. Uh, so we, we are able to see that there's a lot of turmoil. All these problems will be immediately solved when we enter Elizabeth's period. With the minute we enter Elizabethan age, we are able to see a sea change. All these problems are getting resolved. So till the time you don't understand the background, you will not be able to understand and compare it with the other ages as well. So that is also one of the reasons why we are able to see that background is becoming important. Foregrounding the background is important. Okay, there is a question uh, that we are coming up with. So, so when we are talking about all of these, right? For instance, all of these uh, so-called uh, uh, all all of these uh, songs that we are having, these are trying to tell you about the male culture. What are ma men doing, right, in their free time? What are men essentially doing? Are they partying? Are they having leisure activities altogether uh, in the twenty-first century? What are how are men partying? What what, what exactly do they do? Uh, so now there is a question for all of you and I hope classroom students are able to revise. Um, so La Male Rigel, La Male Rigel, who is the author of La Male Rigel? This is also an important text which is coming during the barony. So how many of you can actually recollect that? Yes, everyone. So what is it? What is it that we're able to see? I at least want the classroom students to definitely answer. The foundation bad students should certainly know the answer. They should not go wrong with it at all. Uh, they should immediately be able to understand and answer it correctly. Yes, very good. Yes, so uh, La Male Regal, it's actually the male regimen. This is translated as the male regimen. You can even write it down. This is translated as the male regimen right this is translated as the male regimen la male re, uh, la uh, sorry uh, la male regal this is the male regimen that we're talking about it is actually giving you a very vivid picture about the delights of the bachelor's evening right uh, so what is it trying to portray it is giving you a vivid account of the delights of men how were they partying delights of men all together what were their pursuits now go back to elizabethan age now if you go back to your re revision of elizabethan age what are we able to see Elizabethan age, your public theatres are outside the city uh, premises. Why? So there is Thames and then, you know, your, your so-called theatre houses are situated outside Thames. Why? That is because, you know, outside it's considered to be away from rules. Therefore, in Midsummer Night's Dream, what are you able to see? Midsummer Night's Dream by, by uh, William Shakespeare, you're able to see that everybody has to travel outside Athens. Athens is representing authority and control. Everybody has to travel outside in order to figure out autonomy, right? Uh, so, so that is another aspect which comes across over here. So, uh, what we are able to see over here is, um, uh, Zia, you can always research that what were men, uh, uh, if uh, uh, La Male Regale is being written, what were what were the pursuits that women were engaged in during the time? You can always research, but women were accompanying to watch the uh, place for sure, even though they were not allowed to participate in acting altogether. So uh, here you are able to see that this particular work is trying to give you a vivid picture about the delights of bachelor's evening, bachelor's evening, how they were going to taverns, how they were going to cook shops of Westminster's, right? Uh, so they, they were visiting taverns, they were going to taverns, they were visiting the cook shops which were there, right? They were going to cook shops of Westminster, cook shops of Westminster, that is what they were actually doing. They were visiting all these places, cook shops of Westminster, they were visiting taverns altogether. So Thomas Ockleve is the person, right? Ockleve, oh God, what is wrong? Ockleve is a person who is writing. Ockleve is a writer who's written uh, La Male, uh, La Male Regale or the Male Regiment, which is coming in 1406, right? When is this work coming in? This work is coming in 1406. 1406 is when this work is coming in. Please keep that in mind. 
Now, when we are looking at the prose writings, for instance, because prose is only coming during the early Tudor period, poetry, literature, uh, that is taking a backseat altogether because there is a lot of political instability that you are able to see. There is also uh, your, remember, Wycliffe is going to be coming, translation of the Bibles have come in, rise of few, uh, Protestantism is coming in. Uh, you, are, you are able to see John Calvin as well as you are able to observe Martin Luther, Protestantism is getting spearheaded and the changes that are taking place because of Henry VIII as well, the father of Queen Elizabeth. So that is also another important thing that comes across. So prose is becoming really important. And please remember when we are talking about prose, there are two important things. Again, this is something that is mentioned in Dr. T.N. Singh's book as well. The great vowel shift is coming in. We are able to see that there is a great vowel shift that comes in. There is a great vowel shift that comes in. Uh, what is a great vowel shift? The change in pronunciation from 14th century to 17th century. The, the change that is taking place. And you are also able to see the pastern letters coming in. The pastern letters are how you are able to see that the family of Norfolk is giving us some of the most incredible accounts. We come to know a, a lot about the period. We come to know a, a lot about the period altogether. So, prose style is developing. This, these two are the contextual backgrounds of the 15th century period, also called the early Tudor period that we are able to see. The great vowel shift is taking place. The great vowel shift is basically talking about how there is a massive change in the pronunciation. There is a massive change that you are able to see in the pronunciation that was there previously. So the pronunciation patterns are actually changing. That is called the great vowel shift that is taking place during this particular time period. Now, please remember that when we are talking about, even yesterday, remember when in the live session we were talking about John Gower. What did we talk about in con while talking about Confessio Amantis? Confessio Amantis was written at the request of whom? Confessio Amantis was written at the request of which uh, particular king? Can anyone put it in the chat box? We actually discussed it yesterday only. We talked about it yesterday. So when we are talking about, when we are discussing about John Gower, what are we able to see yesterday when during the live session, what did we say? The monarch is ordering that there need to be more works in English. So also remember that now people are not speaking Latin and French. English is also becoming a prestigious language. English is also being spoken by the elite, the aristocrats. Go back to your cultural studies notes. Anything which becomes a part of your mainstream culture has to first get, get its validation from the elite culture. Has to first get, uh, get garner the sort of approval from your aristocratic order, the elite order, the dominant discourse, the people who are at the power. They need to give a consent and then things proceed. Remember that? That is what we actually discussed about. Yes, King Richard II. So now English is becoming the language of the uh, elite social prestige altogether. So what you are able to basically see is that there are a couple of prose writers who are coming and even they are talking about uh, the use of English per se. Uh, English is becoming, of course, a sort of an important language that is coming in. I'll quickly hide myself so that you can see this particular part. So Capgrave is the chronicler that we are able to look at and Capgrave is actually giving us a comprehensive account of saints. Capgrave is giving us a comprehensive account of the saints. So what we are able to see is, yes, Shalini, very good. I'm so proud of everyone. Yes, everyone's got that right. So Capgrave is coming in. Right. And what is Capgrave doing? Capgrave is actually trying to help us with a compilation. He's a chronicler. We've actually looked at two chroniclers so far. Remember, Froissart was the first chronicler that we talked about. Froissart at the beginning. At the beginning, we discussed that Froissart is coming in. I hope you can all recollect. This is the second chronicler that we are talking about. And yesterday, during the 11.30 p.m. live session, we had spoken about... We've spoken about Geoffrey of Monmouth. Remember, Geoffrey of Monmouth was the person who popularized King Arthur's legends altogether. He was the one who popularized it and Christine de Troyes is taking it further. That is what we had actually looked at. Okay, so Capgrave is of course becoming important. Life of Saint Catherine of Alexandria. Life of Saint uh, Catherine of Alexandria. This is something which is coming from Capgrave's account. This is something that Capgrave is associated with, right? So he is a theologian. He is a theologian, theologian, hagiographer, hagiographer, somebody who is trying to capture the lives of saints. Theologian, theos, root word, related to God and religion. He is a historian who is trying to capture all of these. He is trying to capture all of these. Life of Saint Catherine, he is writing it in English. This question can come in your exams. 
right so please keep that in mind you can make a, a proper you can get a bigger sheet for compiling the notes right now and just make so understand this is how you're supposed to be approaching all the ages cover all the prose writers cover first of all get a background knowledge cover prose writers cover the uh, the so called uh, poetry uh, poetry that are, uh, the the poetry uh, poetic works that are coming in the poems that are coming in important dramas if novel is there non fictional prose writings right all those things important concepts like the great vowel shift pastern letters these are the two important concepts associated with the early tudor period the understanding of what is happening in the early tudor period because hilary mantel and writers like that are using the early tudor period for their writing so that also becomes important peacock is coming peacock is writing the represser of overmuch blaming of clergy peacock is coming in and he's writing the represser of overmuch blaming of clergy he is coming and he is talking about it so clergy is going to be getting a lot of flake from a lot of writers clergy will be attacked because it's not solving the purpose that it was supposed to be solving it is not closer to god it's rather becoming very greedy so what we are therefore able to see we are able to see that there's a lot of discontent from other people especially when they are talking about clergy so peacock is coming up with the represser of overmuch blaming of the clergy that is what he is writing cap grave the the story that he is telling you about catherine right saying he is a geographer he is a theologian so he is a geographer he is a theologian uh prosticu is coming so john prosticu is coming and he is writing on the governance of england he is talking about on the governance of england governance is also becoming an important issue how courtiers have to behave Baldassare Castelloni would talk about it. How governance have to, uh, how people, uh, Prince Nicolo. Uh, so when we look at Machiavelli, Nicolo Machiavelli is prince. In the Italian context, it's telling the Medici family how are you supposed to be controlling, what sort of methodology you need to follow in order to control. That is another thing that you are able to see. Julian of Norwich, Julian of Norwich is also there, right? Julian of Norwich, the priestess that we are talking about, the mystic who is coming in. So a lot of writings, if you can categorize political writings coming in, which are either critical, uh, religious writings that are coming in, compiling the lives of saints, or being critical of the clergy altogether. So those are the kind of writings that we are able to see. Pastern letters, the Pastern family of Norfolk. they are trying to tell you about the times they are trying to tell you about how it was to be an upper class member of the society very important documents the pastern letters the pastern letters the great vowel shift these are the two important aspects that are taking place when we are looking at the 15th century skeleton john skeleton john skeleton also we will we'll, we'll just be talking about skeleton again uh, but please remember whenever we we are looking at writers like uh, john skeleton there are a couple of things that you have to keep in mind uh, what are some of the pointers that you can actually remember about skeleton <clears throat> first of all he was actually an unofficially appointed poet laureate all right uh, so skeleton is coming across skeleton is there and uh, he is not like an officially appointed uh, poet laureate but nonetheless he is a sort of a poet laureate that you are able to see who's coming in uh, writing uh, the book of uh, the sorrows of philip uh, sparrow so that is of course becoming like a really important work all together uh, that is coming from his pen but uh, you also need to keep in mind that you know he's the informal poet laureate he's an academic person most of the writers are academic in nature he was tutor to henry the 8th he was a tutor to henry the 8th so uh, john skeleton he was tutor <clears throat> to henry the 8th he was tutor to henry the 8th just like roger ascham was tutor to queen uh, to princess elizabeth and he was known for skeletonic verses what are skeletonic verses what do we mean by skeletonic verses so when we are talking about skeletonic verses what are these skeletonic verses that we are talking about can anyone put it in the chat box what do we mean by skeletonic verses what do we mean by skeletonic verses yes he is developing the character of colin cloud very good shalini excellent Yes, absolutely right. These are these are basically no. Yes, the book of Philip Sparrow is good. See, these are very ir irregular, energetic, satirical lines that we are able to see. Very innovative lines, very similar to John Donne's poetry. Uh, John Donne's poetry also remember that they were very uh, different. Colloquial style was being used. They were marking a departure from Elizabethan style of writing. The book of Philip Sparrow, as all of you are mentioning in the chat box, fifteen o five. Where a schoolgirl is comparing her love for the dead sparrow with other kinds of love, 
it was actually inspired by catullus catullus was the uh, classical poet and he was the one who was a major source of inspiration there we will we will be coming back to uh, you know we'll just be coming back to skelton again um the first printed book some of them the history of troy is there the first dated book dicts and sayings of philosophers dicts and sayings of philosophers this is also a question that comes in so basically what is happening you need to understand that the early tudor period when we are talking about the early tudor period renaissance humanism is already trying to be uh, you know accepted people are understanding renaissance is already started um italy italian scholars have already started unearthing the works altogether so what we are able to see when we talk about the early tudor period when we are looking at the earlier tudor period humanism is there there are changes that are taking place in religion so reformation is coming in reformation religious changes people want to reform martin luther martin luther is an important figure there people are trying to discover newer territories so there is a discovery which is also enabling them better perspective right so there is expansion activities remember when we were talking about english in india we spoke about how even before the charter of 1813 which is allocating 1 lakh rupees for english education in india we were able to see that the charter that queen elizabeth is signing in 1600 that is becoming important because because of that we are able to see that the east india company is going to start their trade uh, endeavors so this is actually getting newer uh, newer ideas imagination is getting instilled there is expansion of territories there is an expansion of uh, geographic boundaries that you are able to see right the geographic boundaries are getting completely expanded there is of course renaissance humanism man is becoming the center man is seen to be the center altogether that is another important pointer that is coming in man suddenly becomes the center overall that we are able to see broadening of horizons uh please remember here italian triumvirate italian writers petrarch boccaccio dante aristo they are all influencing they are all influencing they are all the people who are influencing during this particular period that is what you are able to see renaissance humanism uh, always remember you are also students of post humanism you are also students of post humanism so post humanism is actually the opposite of renaissance humanism post humanism is talking about beyond and human and how humans are now wedded to how humans are now wedded to technology so sooner it's like you know now becoming a symbiotic relationship altogether right now for for instance even for this classroom right uh, had it been like an offline classroom we would have physically met but this is an online one so what we are able to basically see over here in the online format is that because of technology we're able to le leverage it, the camera the uh, the lights the the green screen etc that is making the the class possible so uh, post humanism is a different concept altogether the cyborg theory uh, donna haraway is also a leading figure in post humanism but renaissance humanism is a different concept altogether renaissance humanism is actually laying emphasis on uh, on on man at the center the vitruvian man at the center Petrarch is considered to be the founder of Renaissance humanism. Petrarch is considered to be the founder of Renaissance humanism. Italians as it is are inspiring Renaissance humanism. Man is becoming the center proper study of man is actually considered to be man himself. Remember yesterday when we were talking about concepts like you know a chastity is better than marriage or when we were talking about the body itself the body itself is actually uh, you know the the place the house altogether that is what we discussed in the 11:30 pm lecture remember so man is really important man is becoming the center overall so man was at the center man was at the center dignity of man was very important dignity of man was becoming really important during renaissance humanism that is what you are able to see uh and and please remember all of this all of these ideas were spreading because of the printing press gutenberg is coming gutenberg so if you read orion black swan uh, it makes it very very clear that because gutenberg's printing press is coming that is the reason people are able to read it better so the printing press is coming in so pamphlets are there newer ideas are available newer ideas are easily available the idea of a gentleman is also becoming important so printing is there printing press is coming this is making the availability of ideas you are also able to see that there is this concept of gentleman now this gentleman is actually a well read person this gentleman is a well read person you are going back to classical times where rhetoricians were very important just give me one second i'll switch off this ac one second 
Oh God, why is this not just the second? Right. So what we are able to basically see is that there, there were these two primary uh, concerns that are coming in. A, you're going back to the classical text. One has to be very well read in these classical texts. One should be very, very well read, well received. The idea of a gentleman. Now, uh, so so see, there is a difference. Yesterday, we, when we were talking, when we were going live at, uh, during the 11.30 p.m. IG session, what did we talk about? We were discussing about romances, right? We were discussing about Arthurian romances. Arthurian romances, the knights had to prove their metal through their bravery but now there is a shift now there is a shift a gentleman is a well-read person a gentleman is a well-read person that is what you're able to see the toughest exam that we're talking about in the country the upsc exam checks how well read are you how well aware are you about what is happening around you, your, yourself so what you're basically able to see is that the idea of a gentleman uh baldesa castelloni is actually presenting that in the courtier so Thomas Hobby is actually translating the courtier into English and making it available. So Castelloni is a person, he is an Italian, Italian person. He is a courtier, so to say, and he's talking about, uh, you know, the courtier. The courtier is a work that he's writing. So he is a nobleman. He is a courtier himself. Courtier are all these people who were working very closely with the monarch, so to say. And he's talking about who should an ideal courtier be. He's discussing, he's talking about that what are the features that you're able to see in an ideal courtier, who is essentially an ideal courtier. This is something that he's trying to help us understand. And it is all written in a very conversational manner. Now, please remember in the courtier, he gives us a very important concept of spread satura. In, in the courtier, this is the book called the courtier. The courtier was, was getting translated. The courtier was a work that was getting translated by Thomas Hobby. And spread satura is nonchalance. That means my speaking should not look contrived. My speaking should look very effortless. How, how should my communication be like? My communication should look very effortless. My communication should be absolutely effortless. Spread satura. That is what he is discussing. He discusses that, you know, that there needs to be spread satura. So, essentially, what is he telling you? He is trying to help us understand. He is trying to help us uh, understand the fact that, you know, a courtier has to be a well-read person. And only if you're a well-read person, would you be able to articulate your ideas well. And that was something which was important for him for a courtier. Predominantly, that is what he's trying to help us understand. Right? That is, of course, becoming really important in the case of... Uh, of your Baldassa Castelloni. So Castelloni is coming in. He's the one who's helping us understand all of these pointers. Give me one second. I think, uh, right. So please keep that in mind that whenever we are, yes, uh, Tabasum. So Thomas Hobby is translating that. Uh, so spread satura is this effortless interaction that we're able to see, right? This is the effortless, this is the one. Oh, this is not the one. Just a second, just a second. I was actually switching on the laptop charger and in the process, I think I've shifted my yeah perfect right so uh, so what is basically happening what are we predominantly able to see over here is that there is a shift that you're able to see from the previous middle ages where there was a stress on different virtues right bravery was appreciated and applauded but now there is a con uh, there's a massive shift that we are able to see education is becoming very important education Right. Education is something that is given a lot of uh, primacy. Education is becoming important. The study of Greek classical texts, the use of vernacular is something that is getting promoted. Use of vernacular is becoming important. People are now remember uh, that is what we were talking about. The great vowel shift. English now started having social prestige. There was social prestige that was added along with English. So the complete education of a gentleman is something that we are actually also looking at. Okay, so whenever we are, whenever we are talking about, whenever we are discussing or looking at the Baron age particularly or the early Tudor period, we're able to see that education is becoming important. The complete education of a person that is becoming uh, important and that is getting promoted as well. 
all right uh, let's just come on to a question let's just uh, practice a question over here this is a question who is the protagonist of nicholas odal by the way nicholas odal is also associated with academic drama there is a key term in your oxford companion or your penguin companion academic drama nicholas odal so drama that was meant for the purposes of teaching somebody something that was the academic drama that we were talking about drama that would actually teach some people something that was academic drama what is the right answer here who is the protagonist of nicholas odal's ralph royster doister ralph royster doister who is the protagonist that we are talking about uh, who is the protagonist right ralph royster doister some of you are answering it as well okay yes absolutely right absolutely right so ralph royster doister what you are able to see is that there is a rich widow kristen custins right so rich widow is there and the rich widow is the central protagonist the rich widow that you are having the rich widow is actually the central protagonist who's coming in all right uh, she is betrothed some of you are saying gone good luck gone good luck is a merchant right gone good luck that you are able to see he is a merchant and we are able to see that uh, kristen custins is actually betrothed to him custins is betrothed to him custins is betrothed to him so that is a separate issue altogether right that is a separate issue altogether ralph royster doister um, he is encouraged throughout there is a trickster figure matthew mary greek matthew mary greek is there mary greek uh, matthew mary greek keeps on telling ralph royster doister that you should woo kristen custins you should woo her completely all right uh, but that does not succeed. seeds at all uh, you know ralph also tries with his friends and servants to break and take customs by force uh but you know he is defeated by the maids he is not able to continue that so merchant goan arrives he is he is coming and the play actually concludes there is reconciliation there's a prayer there is a song you can also get the question how is it ending it's ending with reconciliation that is also one of the reasons why it is a comedy altogether so uh, but please remember nicholas odal is also associated with academic drama always okay uh, one of his contemporaries uh, that is roger astrum roger astrum uh, is writing toxophilus schoolmaster right uh, so schoolmaster is a major work of roger astrum just like uh, we we saw right now that how you are able to see that you know um, uh, okay let me ask you who's the tutor of henry the 8th and who's the tutor of princess elizabeth quickly put it in the chat box please quickly put it in the chat box so when we are coming on to roger astrum's major work the schoolmaster is very important it's written in english prose it's a very simple work that is coming in uh, the schoolmaster and it's making a very very simple appeal that we need to train we need to train the teachers also the teachers also have to be trained in a particular way uh so ideals of education are being mentioned uh, basically whenever you talk about any book on education it is focusing on the behavioral styles of students and teachers it's talking about the psychology of learning right it's basically what what will it it be discussing it will be discussing the psychology of learning what will be the psychology of learning that will be the primary area that will be the primary topic that will be discussed right what is the psychology of learning altogether um so education is really important uh, intellect your personality becomes really important over here this is exactly what you see so any university that you will start working with and you will become uh, you know also members of the placement cells uh, so as uh, you will be conducting these sessions what will you be telling them that you have to build your personal brand you have to showcase what are you good at you need to build your own presence all together this is what you are actually teaching them right so school master is a major work that you are able to see school master yes skelton very good survey skelton is there uh who's coming who's becoming the tutor john skelton is the tutor to henry the 8th and roger astrum is the tutor to princess elizabeth so please keep that in mind and school master is the most important work where he is talking about intellectual personality psychology of learning uh, he is basically telling you the humanistic education plan the humanistic education plan is coming and Toxophilus is a book on archery that he is writing. Toxophilus, it's a book, lover of the bow. Toxophilus, fill root word means love. Fill root word means love. And Toxophilus, when we are looking at Toxophilus, it's written in the form of a dialogue, and it is one of the primary books that we are able to see, which is coming on archery. Even Castle of Health by Thomas Eliot, that is also trying to tell you about uh, uh, about how you need to have the agility of physical activity. 
that is also something which is important uh, who is championing the english prose during the baron age a champion of english prose is actually thomas eliot the provider of the first latin english dictionary that we are able to see evolution of dictionary uh, we are able to see eliot's dictionary is really important he was also a member of thomas more circle and he is writing a couple of uh, works first of all his latin english dictionary is important second castle of health castle of health is also called regimen of health right it's actually uh, like a sort of a regime of health so castle of health is also becoming important this is a major work that he is writing castle of health even if you look at the oxford companion it will give you a proper idea the book named the governor is also important right 1531 the book named the governor the book named the governor <clears throat> the book named the governor the book named the governor this is also an important work that we are able to see the book named the governor which is coming in so book named the governor is trying to talk about how uh, you can actually uh, make sure that there is a gentleman's son so how can you try and bring them up what sort of an upbringing should you give them right so that they are prepared for a life ahead so that they are prepared for a life ahead so uh, the 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 entire concept of how an ideal gentleman a renaissance gentleman should be this is what he is actually talking about right that's a predominant focus now uh, when we are talking about desiderius erasmus desiderius erasmus is also an important writer of the period uh, erasmus is also called erasmus of rotterdam uh, he is a dutch person he's a dutch humanist he's also a scholar but please remember he is a dutch scholar so to say right he's a dutch scholar who's coming in now you know uh, thomas more was a very good friend of both thomas eliot as well as uh, desiderius erasmus he is writing the praise of folly or moria in comnium the praise of folly the praise of folly 1511 or moria in comnium the praise of folly is becoming an important work the praise of folly this is a major work that he is writing this is a major work which is coming from his pen altogether and title moria in comnium the praise of folly is title it is actually making fun of thomas more right uh, it is actually making fun of thomas more but it is actually critiquing clergy it is saying that not only is the clergy corrupt but the clergy is also ignorant half the things that you go to them and ask them questions about they cannot answer you they cannot help you out so not only are they corrupt but they are also ignorant altogether that is what another aspect that comes in he is very critical of the clergy he is very very critical of the clergy over here that is another point that we are able to look at right uh, so uh, desiderius erasmus also becomes an important scholar uh, before we go ahead and further and you know there are questions and of course we also have to look at the novels let's just quickly see how many of you are awake okay uh, quickly tell me the publication dates of the courtier the publication dates of the courtier by castelloni the italian nobleman and the courtier the courtier the courtier or oh, the courtier what is the publication date of the courtier everybody quickly just to see how many of you are awake not all of you are sleeping the courtier what is the publication date courtier was written from 1513 to 1518 and it was getting published in 1528 it was getting published in 1528 okay it was getting published in 1528 please remember that uh, please keep that aspect properly in mind who is translating the courtier who is translating the courtier i'm not getting the answers on the chat box are we writing it down who is translating the courtier very good pragya that's the publication date zahida 1513 it's the written part 1513 to 18 writing and then publication is 1528 who is translating the courtier who is the person who's translating the courtier everybody very good shikha right zahida wahida pragya everybody is right so thomas hobby is translating it when is he translating it 1561 1561 is when he is translating it all together okay what is the central uh, what is the central agenda of humanism what was humanism all about what was humanism all about what is the central agenda of humanism so humanism wanted to study wanted to teach the curriculum in grammar rhetoric moral philosophy poetry through classical literature it's more like liberal arts of today when we talk about liberal arts of today so humanism wanted to teach you know it wanted to teach grammar rhetoric moral philosophy poetry history via classical texts altogether that is renaissance humanism 
right that is the education that you wanted to give all together all right uh, so book of philip sparrow by john skelton was inspired by which poet and that was there on the slide as well the book of philip sparrow by john skelton was actually inspired by which figure it was inspired by which figure wow termina is like ma'am at the center <laughs> was inspired by which figure we we just do, doing that so all these i hope you are now understanding what all pointers also you have to remember after you've done your evaluation what all things you definitely have to keep in mind catalyst siali has got the right answer catalyst the book of philip sparrow was inspired by the roman poet catalyst catalyst is there uh, and and skeltonic verse is actually a precursor to which kind of a metaphysical poets writings skeltonic verse remember we had actually talked about yes yes catalyst is fine what about what about the other one no worries i i understood them and i understood that yes everybody i i am looking forward to the answer yes the skeltonic verse was actually getting inspired it was very similar to the writings of a particular poet remember we we discussed john dunn's poetry john dunn's poetry i hope you can recollect that we actually talked about it uh, also please tell me how many generations are covered in the pastern letters which is telling you about the pastern family of norfolk how many generations are covered yes sir be good how many generations are covered how many generations are getting covered is just a sort of a uh, test to gauge how many of you were paying attention how many of you have not fallen asleep because there's be and this is what you should ideally do study in blocks of 40 45 minutes take a quick 2 minute break ask yourself what have you studied take a stretch break also and then come back and sit together because now because we are talking about attention economy and time space is like a really becoming a problematic thing so it's always a good idea to focus on these things three generations absolutely right three generations of the well to do paston family of norfolk that is absolutely right uh, one more thing i want you all to tell me uh, uh, now when we talk about peacock peacock is a religious controversialist he's written a work what is the name of the work that peacock has written the the work that peacock has written peacock was writing a particular work what is the work that peacock has written yes yes that is fine three generations is fine he's writing the repressor of overmuch blaming of the clergy the repressor of the overmuch blaming of the clergy okay on that note let's just quickly come on to a question that i have for you and this is from nicolo machiavelli is the prince classroom students will be aware about this already machiavelli is the discourses on livy machiavelli is the discourses on livy is divided into how many parts it is getting divided into how many parts discourses on livy by machiavelli half the times we forget uh, machiavelli is also writing discourses on livy it is having a dedication letter there are books also which are there he is writing 142 chapters in the books how many books are there very good pragya wahida <clears throat> okay what is the right answer here nicolo machiavelli is the discourses on livy it is divided into how many books No, no, no. It's not five. It's divided into three books. Juhi has got the right answer. It's divided into three books, right? In the preface to the bo- the first book, Machiavelli is telling you that why is he writing the discourse? Uh, what is the major reason for him? But the Prince is a very important work by Niccolo Machiavelli, right? The Prince is like a very, very important work by Niccolo Machiavelli. There's another question on Machiavelli. Uh, which of which of his book, Mac- uh, in which of his book, Machiavelli makes an important distinction between the two groups, the great and the people. The The great and the people. You know, yesterday or day before yesterday on YouTube, I don't know. It was just showing in my suggestions while I was scrolling. I think um, where Twinkle Khanna, right? Twinkle Khanna, right? Uh, Akshay uh, Khanna, uh, Akshay uh, Akshay's uh, wife, right? Um, his his wife was taking the interview uh, of uh, royalty, and she was saying that you know before the prep, she I, I have to see the entire thing. But she was saying, uh, do they still kill the commoners if you know if if the the commoners are not up to the mark? So I'm really scared uh, because I'm going to meet royal. ability and nobility so that is what she was talking about yes prince is the right answer the prince is the right answer the prince is absolutely the right answer so in the prince machiavelli is t- trying to tell you that there are two groups of people present in every city 
right and there are appetites that are driving them there are different appetites that are driving them this should actually inspire you the great and the people how are they differentiated because there are different appetites that are driving them so somebody who does extra work has got a side hustle as well uh, or you know is doing much more is trying to study work etc do a lot of stuff so that is because of the appetite that they have is very different to a person who just works for 2 hours 3 hours at max then enjoys like you know 13 hours someone like my brother uh vishnath raheja so so that particular thing what what you are basically able to see you are basically able to see what is driving there are different appetites that are driving you there are various different appetites that you are able to see that are driving and this is what differentiates great and the common people all together that is what machiavelli says that these two people are always there but having said that he further goes and in a in a nasty like so the, not always the great are the best people the great are always wanting to oppress they want to rule the people right and the people they they constantly want to be ruled they're like okay we don't want to do anything we will we will get ruled by you right so the great who wish to oppress and rule the people who are the great people according to machiavelli next time you can get the question like that these are people who wish to oppress these are people who wish to oppress these are people who want to oppress others they are really crazy about oppressing people they want to rule the people so to say what do they want to do they want to rule the people that is the primary agenda that they are having they want to rule the people all together that is the primary agenda while the people the people wish not to be ruled or oppressed right the people they 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 do not they they are they are like okay fine you you can rule us right they are absolutely fine they're giving they're giving their their consent all together okay now um now what you are able to see is that the people at times are also not wanting to be ruled that is another concept that comes across that is another concept that comes across over here so a lot of pointers that you know machiavelli is writing in the prince the prince i suggest should be your homework for today try to go over it try to go over a more a more utopia as well try to take a tour of that uh, it'll really help you out altogether so basically what you have to understand is that uh, that there are scholars there are philosophers who are coming in they are telling us about humanism humanism is really concerned about multiple of these things right what is humanism primarily concerned about humanism is saying that that man is developing the universe created by god man is trying to develop the universe that is created by god beauty is becoming a very important topic inner beauty is becoming really important because that will lead to your uh, your meeting god all together you know it was very opposed to philosophy of the scholars the scholars uh, 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 people who were represented by people like thomas aquinas humanism was against scholars altogether because the scholars were more like okay theoretical in nature but but what you are able to see is that humanism is is focusing on interpretations humanism is focusing on interpretation so what is it trying to tell you that god fine has created uh, the world but it's actually man who's trying to perfect it that is what humanism was trying to talk about man is developing man is developing all together that was the major attempts of humanism but please remember that inner beauty is becoming important inner beauty is something which is really important but the most terrifying aspect of humanism was the trial of galileo even brecht talks about it bertol brecht is also talking about the crisis that is there in humanism is basically the trial of galileo very similar to the classical times how socrates and that is the reason aristotle said that i am moving out of athens because i do not want athens to sin against another philosopher so there are classical parallels that you can draw uh, so what is happening is that the trial of galileo is showing the crisis that we are able to see in humanism the problems that are there in humanism that you are talking about uh, you know interpretation but if it's going excessive uh, or it's trying to uh, you know not talk about the the conservative aspect then you're taken you're you're really taken aback you're really taken aback that is what uh, is being coming across so the trial of galileo is actually the very sad part of humanism altogether right so humanism all round development is really important moral development is important see basically understand this okay what is humanism talking about humanism is talking about reason humanism is talking about being well read you have to be absolutely well read instinct is not something important but reason is moral goodness is really important moral goodness is important that is something that that you know humanism was actually trying to talk about 
all round development now uh, the da vinci's uh, win, uh, you know so so when we are talking about the vitruvian man the concept of the vitruvian man is also central vitruvian man was actually uh, you know this this uh, uh, this work which was created by leonardo da vinci in 1487 and what is it trying to tell you it is trying to tell you literally that now human the the anatomy of the human body is becoming important vitruvian man Vitruvian man is actually something which is which is uh, which is really important. Man is the central major, the anatomy of man. Man is becoming important. He's a center. From a theocentric world, you you moving on to a human centric world altogether. So Renaissance is actually marking a great big big departure from valuing being well read to uh, going and taking man at the center to going back to Greco classical text altogether to the use of English. to the use of english under the influence of uh, people like uh, dante uh, petrarch and boccaccio who were also talking about using the vernacular language altogether so all of these are really important right all of these are really important you're going back to the classical text right you're going back to the classical text you are able to see that education is something which is laying down the central uh, uh, whole altogether there is a certain degree of privileging of reason that is taking place so 16th century therefore is a very interesting period the renaissance is therefore a very very interesting period that we are able to see the renaissance comes across as a really important period there's a growth of vernaculars that we are able to look at right uh, so please keep that in mind that there is cultural development that is taking place now understand this early tudor period we also have to understand the monarchy understanding monarchy like for instance you will have to look at the george the three georgian kings during your 18th century literature so first we have first we are having henry the 7th henry the 7th is actually doing a lot of good what we are able to see is that he is defeating the yorkist king richard the 3rd there is battle of bosworth there is the battle of bosworth classroom students i hope you remember the battle of bosworth at the battle of bosworth he is emerging victorious after defeating richard the 3 then he is getting married to elizabeth of york elizabeth of york so he is trying to basically quell the fight between the houses of lancaster and york he is getting married to the house of york right so there is a problem between the house of lancaster and york so what is he doing he is trying to actually bridge that gap between lancaster and york by getting married to a a, a queen who is coming from york the princess who is coming from york elizabeth of york he is getting married to elizabeth of york so there is an end to the war there is an end to the war of roses and tudor dynasty is getting established Tudor dynasty had the Tudor rose as the symbol, right? The Tudor rose combination of Lancastrian red rose and Yorkist white rose. Red rose and white rose. This question, by the way, has come in your exam. Lancasters had the red rose and York had the white rose. They, this was merged together in a new symbol of the Tudor rose. of the tudor rose that was coming in it was merged merged together so by getting married to elizabeth of york we are able to see he is setting up a very good precedence he is setting up a really good precedence altogether that is important for all of us to remember he is restoring political stability he is getting political stability which was not there for over 100 years now more than 100 years now we were not able to see political stability at all but he's the one who's getting it but his son completely uh, uh, like you know wrecks a lot of havoc over here uh, so please remember what battle of bosworth for henry the 7th for henry the 7th battle of uh, battle of bosworth how is he winning uh, one second where is the highlighter gone so uh, when we are talking about him we should ideally remember the battle of bosworth how he is trying to bridge lancaster the houses of lancaster and york he is getting the tudor rose symbol he is getting married to elizabeth of york so politically it's a very very stable period that is getting ushered because of him there is an absolute stability that we are able to see that is coming go to see uh, you know the endeavors that he is putting that henry the 7th is putting in henry the 8th is also equally an important person even though he creates a lot of problems uh but what we are able to see is that he is getting married first of all to his brother's widow catherine of aragon okay he gets married to catherine of aragon catherine of aragon is the brother's widow catherine of aragon uh aragon he gets married now catholics say that you know you cannot marry twice they very very strict rule keepers all together now what happens is catherine who's from an influential spanish dynasty now uh, she wants to get divorced from her 
he wants to get married to ann bolian after that again he gets married multiple times six times but now he wants to get married to ann bolian he is wanting to get married to ann bolian now the catholics will not actually because you know he wants a son he is predominantly wanting a son and therefore he wants to get married to ann bolian but the catholics would not permit that so what is happening is he, in 1534 he is getting an act which is establishing the act of supremacy 1534 act of supremacy is coming in this can actually come in your exam as well the act of supremacy is coming in what is this act of supremacy the act of supremacy is establishing the king as the head of the english church the anglican church was replacing the catholic church you had the anglican church getting replacing the catholic church anglican church was replacing the catholic church altogether that was another thing that we were able to look at right so please keep that in mind that you know uh, he's the one henry of course was succeeded by edward the 6th please remember this also <clears throat> that when we are talking about henry uh, so first henry the 7th is coming then henry the 8th is coming after henry the 8th we are able to see that edward is coming right his child edward the 6th is coming and he is ruling for 6 years edward the 6th is coming and he is ruling for 6 years he is actually ruling for 6 years after that we are able to see that there is a small brief period where the second child comes in and finally queen elizabeth is coming and taking taking over from 1558 to 1603 as the last tudor monarch so please keep that in mind you know thomas cranmer thomas cranmer is coming with the first book of common prayer the first book of common prayer was being used in your church of england as well so a lot of uh, like you know turmoil coming in and bolian and bolian uh, you know uh, is is basically the mother of queen elizabeth as well and hilary mantles bring up the body is also talking about and bolian thomas cromwell is the person who actually engineered the divorce between uh, your henry the 8th and catherine of aragon but ultimately you know he he had to face the brunt he was executed for treason he was executed for treason because obviously the king could not really trust anyone the king was not in a position to trust anyone at all and bloody mary is also important by the way uh, you do do uh, you do have questions so basically edward had fallen very ill edward the 6th had fallen very very ill and then his cousin lady jane grey came but what happened was lady jane grey was imprisoned and mary tudor who was the daughter of henry the 8th mary tudor uh, she was the daughter of catherine of aragon uh, all right and uh, your uh, henry the 8th catherine of aragon and henry the 8th she became queen mary the 1st she restored catholicism but then you know we were able to see because she she had killed over 300 protestants uh, so she was called bloody mary and she died childless only that is the reason queen elizabeth is actually coming and ruling so 1553 uh, from 1553 all the way till 1558 we are able to see that there is a little bit of turmoil because after the death of edward the 6th we are able to see that you know lady jane grey is coming but lady jane grey is not at all effective uh, as a leader and lady jane grey is then getting replaced by mary mary she is the daughter of catherine of aragon and henry the 8th she is the daughter of catherine of aragon and henry the 8th uh now when we are looking at of course we'll we'll be uh, wrapping this baronage part and i'll also be introducing novel very very quickly please remember uh, we will pause over here actually we'll we'll be pausing over here in terms of the baronage period but please remember these are the these are the things that are taking place at the background right all of the writers are coming in they're all coming in uh, thomas more's utopia by the way is a very important bo book please look at that so today you can actually look at thomas more's utopia and the prince by nicolo machiavelli wyatt and sari uh, are also coming wyatt is in introducing horatian satires he is introducing uh, the the sonnet forms all together so what you are able to see is he is influenced by petrarch in that particular regard right he is getting influenced by petrarch but these are all artificial in nature they are all artificial in nature but what we'll do right now is uh, i will now pause over here for the baronage but i hope it gives you a little bit of idea how you're supposed to be approaching baronage uh, what are the key things that you actually have to focus on baronage there are a couple of questions also but i think i also want to give you a slice of life because i told you slice of uh, how you can prepare because i told you that we'll be covering um, 
we'll be covering your so called novel as well so i think uh, it's it's actually appropriate to also cover novel very very quickly so uh, now what are the things that you and very briefly this will be very very brief and quick so don't worry about it so when we are talking about a novel novel is also a very important topic beginning of novel uh, particularly the 18th century novel tradition even though novel is coming before that also writers like thomas nashes unfortunate traveler is considered to be an example of picaresque writing afra ben that we will be studying today in the foundation batch so we'll be able to see that afra ben's writings are also considered to be a precursor to the novel form novella form altogether uh, that is coming across uh, but please remember there are certain things that we have to be very mindful of that how serialized novels are coming in how novel as a form remember yesterday when we were talking about the features of post modern literature post modern novels altogether roman of fluve metaphysical meta uh, narrator uh, meta fictional elements are coming in roman of fluve is there social political works comic realism all of those pointers that we were discussing so novel is a very rich uh, genre altogether but ultimately you have to remember that novel is catering to the spirit of storytelling remember we we discussed a question on amenuses amenuses were these writers amenuses were the writers who were actually helping the slaves to pen down their writings right remember amenuses this is what amenuses were actually doing so they were basically storytellers who were trying to write who were trying to figure out these stories or uh, uh, like you know these stories which were being dictated to, to them <coughs> i'm so sorry <coughs> Okay, I'm so sorry. Right, so amenuses are coming in. So storytelling is actually a very intrinsic part of our existence. Storytelling is something which is actually intrinsic part of our our existence altogether. Now, when we are talking about the first few stories, wandering singers are there. Uh, there are storytellers who are there that we are able to see. Uh, that we all have to keep in mind so you know novels are coming in novels are also there uh, you know the local aspects are getting highlighted um, you are able to see that they are they're trying to tell the stories now understand this novel is not a new genre the activity of storytelling is something which is old if you look at the legends of troy the trojan stories the trojan war stories that we are able to see arthurian stories king arthur's romances don quixote for instance the tales of chaucer boccaccio's decameron morta di arthur by mallory bunyan's pilgrim's progress so it is not that novel is a new genre it is not that novel is a new genre the storytelling habit was always there this is what even eric orbach talks about this is what even ian watt talks about in the rise of novel this is essentially what they are helping us understand that storytelling was always a part of our existence always right so that is another aspect that we are able to see yes of course of course shikha that is true now some important storytellers thomas delany thomas decker these people who are associated with city comedies they are also storytellers thomas nash the unfortunate traveler so what we are able to see is that your experiences <clears throat> mundane life daily lives all of these are becoming important for from the storytelling perspective so you need to understand that you know even for your phd entrances when you're trying to justify the evolution of novel you can actually quote all these examples that novel is not a genre which is only starting in the 18th century it's actually an older genre that we are able to see all of these are are standing testimony to that particular fact altogether right sydney's arcadia sydney's arcadia is an example that you are able to see of a story being told to you right the authorized version of the bible that you are having so translations of the bible the translations of the bible bacon's writings richard hooker's writings prose is getting developed so novel which is using the prose format is actually getting developed <clears throat> right so that is another important aspect that you are able to see addison and steel addison and steel tatler spectator 
these people are also by by you know by by sharing stories of characters like sir roger de cavale and then bringing across all the writings all together this is actually the art of storytelling so it was always there but a proper format is coming in the 18th century defo and swift are the two trail blazers so to say uh, trail blazers of the novel form of genre because defo daniel defo jonathan swift the way that they are narrating the way that they are using prose writings for their storytelling prose writing storytelling mundane existence everyday life common man so that is something that we are able to see that they are actually becoming really very popular and one of the first novels in english it's actually richardson's pamela which is considered to be one of the first novels in english it is written in an epistolary format letter writing format that we are able to see uh this is considered to be a novel of sensibility jane austen will be critiquing this trend altogether jane austen was trying to critique the trend of uh, sensibility novels in her writings during the regency england period that we are able to see henry fielding henry fielding he is writing comic epic in prose comic epic in prose so uh, satirical works all together the 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 genre is being used in order to critique it's it's basically chronicling very satirical also these are of course the features that we are able to see henry fielding is also telling us about the uh, the traveling and and how why traveling you are able to get a lot of recognition you are becoming more aware Lawrence Stern, very very important. So, Tobias Smollett, Lawrence Stern. So, Tristram Shandy. Ah, uh, when we are looking at Lawrence Stern, uh, Tristram Shandy, that is becoming important. Chronological order is abandoned. Any literature that you open on postmodernism, any book that you open on postmodernism, they always mention. that miguel de cervantes or when we are talking about even dante for for that matter a lot of these writers are also experimental in their style of writing right oliver goldsmith is writing vicar of wakefield vicar of wakefield telling you about domestic life comedy of manners so to say uh, but but in a way you're writing it in the novel format altogether rasselas by dr johnson rasselas by dr johnson so novel as a genre you are able to see storytelling prose writing that is becoming important gothic literature the gothic romances that are coming in the gothic novel style of writing the gothic traditions that are coming in huge vast canvas that we are able to see now this is very important because this is the start of political novel novel as a way which will have a political engagement social engagement it will have a social engagement it is purposive in nature it is having a purpose that it can actually serve all together women writers women writers and radcliffe fanny burney fanny burney and radcliffe these are the women writers who are coming in women writers novel is also trying to break the gender earlier women were not really deemed appropriate to write poet uh, cre create works of poetry but now we are able to see that women are considered to be uh, adept at because also the readers are more women so you know these women are able to present and write better maria edgeworth coming up with castle rackrent regional writing regional novels look at the kind of genres social regional psychological all of them are getting covered focusing on the irish life and the irish condition altogether that is what she is talking about she is predominantly really concerned about that right so all of you really need to be well aware well versed with a couple of these concepts that are coming in charlotte smith charlotte smith writing the old manor house in a very gothic format altogether charlotte smith is also a writer who is coming in so what you are able to see is that there are multiple types of writings that we are able to look at right there are multiple types of writings that we are able to see which are emerging there are oriental tales there are sociological tales there are gothic tales there are domestic writings there are multiple categories of novel writings that are emerging there are multiple categories of novel writings that we are able to see these are certain categories that we are able to look at right so all of you need to be aware that there is a vast canvas when we are talking about novel as a form altogether there is actually a vast vast canvas that we are able to observe especially when we are looking at novel writings right that's a huge scope that we are able to cover so uh, 18th century novel particularly realism epistolary format episodic because they were serialized in nature they are episodic in nature because they were serialized they were getting serialized in nature and therefore they are episodic in nature right they are focusing on middle class they are focusing on the mundane life of the middle class that is the primary aim 
right ultimately they also want to look at the contemporary situation survey the contemporary situation they have a reformatory end they want to reform at the end what are they focusing on at the end they are focusing on a very reformatory zeal that is the major component that we are able to look at reforming is becoming really important we'll pause over here uh, because you know of course we can go on and discuss all of them in greater detail which we will but i hope it gives you an idea ekna sir uh, tries to tell you that you know what is the approach that you have to follow while you're looking at text uh, it is also trying to so we've taken out certain samples from our classroom foundation program only over here and we are presenting it to make you understand that uh, this is exactly how a foundation batch student also learns that how you're supposed to be aware about the background post getting a base of the background then you need to also know the texts that are coming in post the texts are there you also have to simultaneously practice questions based on the topic to get an edge uh, on understanding the topic that is also equally important right so please make sure that all of you are in a position all of you are in a position to make structured well organized notes like i had also posted yesterday on ig the five important strategies the first important strategy is you have to get a birds eye view till the time you don't have a birds eye view things will not fall into place you will have to actually do that so for instance when we are talking about novel we often forget charlotte smith we often forget uh, writers like uh, if, uh, we, we also forget maria edgeworth but edgeworth comes lavishly in your exams so all of them are really very very important okay uh, okay so like i said we'll pause over here thanks a ton for joining me this sunday uh, sunday morning i'll catch up with all of you today at 11:30 as well uh, we have a couple of classes as well today for the foundation batch anyway so um, but but like i said we'll we'll come live at 11:30 till then do read as much as possible try to make sure that all of you are uh, studying even if it's in bits and pieces for 40 minutes taking a little bit of break that's fine uh, as long as you continue your studies i think that is something which is radically important okay thanks to tan everyone wishing you all a very uh, uh, like you know a good great week ahead may you all prepare really well for your exam don't panic don't uh, worry we're there to support you we'll constantly keep in touch okay thank you so much juhi thanks so much uh, thanks so much uh, devdatta you'll be able to see that so uh, basically you can just go on uh, on instagram and i i usually share the link as well on the telegram platform so you can go to the telegram platform and you can get the link it's just like a 10 to 15 minute chit chat that we have for the telegram subscribers okay uh, all right thank you so much thanks zia that's so sweet of you oh, so sweet of you that's very kind of you zia zia has made my day now i'm just like i'm going now okay <laughs> all right thank you so much thanks so much um all right everyone take good care of yourselves if there are any other issues there are any other problems do let us know okay all right god bless each one of you for classroom students i hope it was a good revision for all of you uh, because these were two lectures i hope you know you were able to refresh your memories and again uh, figure out that yes you were supposed to be going back to your lectures consistently so i hope it was a wake up call for all of you and for the remaining i hope it was clear that you know what all do you have to study okay so those are the two 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 objectives that we wanted to achieve thank Thank you, Sushma. Thank you, Nikomoni. Thanks, Tia. Thanks, Suman. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suman, that's there. That's there. That's there. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. God bless. Bye, everyone. Bye, Manisha. Bye.